it's not, but at least I can give you some information. Uh, right now, the poem was about community, and that's what it was in terms of bringing the community together for Mexican American baseball. And so, of course, here's our book that we want to promote as part of a series. We also have Mexican American baseball in Los Angeles, Mexican American baseball in the Inland Empire. And we know that in Cooperstown, New York, there's a Hall of Fame for Anglo American and brother baseball players. Pero que pasó con los Latinos? So, what we're doing is we're creating our own collection at San Bernardino. So, this is one of a series of books. As we talk about our communities, we have, for example, some niños, some children who were playing baseball over in San Juan Capistrano in the early 1900s, about 1917. And we may not have had for uniforms, we may not even have had money for shoes, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't keep our, you know, our play, our games going together, los niños jugando. And in this case, it is los niños missing some shoes right here. But I also want to call your attention to the barrios and the colonias, and I want to ask a few questions. How many of you know about Campo Colorado? All right. How about Richfield? Okay, La Joya, Colonia Independencia, La Fabrica, La Conga, which today is a beautiful parking lot in Anaheim. And so what about uh, Colonia Cinco de Mayo, Talbert? All these, of course, are our neighborhoods that we used to have. And if we don't do something about it, their history isn't going to be told. So this book helps to begin to document some of that history. We have, for example, our book talks about Mexican schools and the importance of baseball in some of the Mexican schools. Here in Anaheim, over on La Palma, Avenue. We had Mr. Jimenez in the 30s and 40s who was very important as a teacher, but he also helped to organize one of the, one of the first baseball teams at the Mexican school. We know a lot about Mendes versus Westminster. We know a lot about Orange, Modena. We know about Garden Grove and Santana. But Anaheim and possibly as many as about 17 other Mexican schools existed in Orange County. So those Mexican schools need to be documented. We also, baseball is of course one of the rituals that we have, along with so many other, for example, carrying La Virgen in our communities. For example, Las Posadas that we had. So baseball was one more event to organize the children, to bring the community together. We have, for example, Rudy Lopez, and I included this picture here so we can get an idea of our homes that we used to have, our clapboard houses that we had in our neighborhoods and our communities. I thought I'd share just a variety of some of the pictures that we have in our books here. For example, we have one of our earliest photos is from the 1920s. For example, Mr. Elcott and Sina over from Edmolina. Many of our baseball teams were sponsored either by tienditas, were sponsored sometimes by cervecerias, by beer companies, sometimes by a local merchant. And so, for example, here we have the Alts team from a sponsored by a beer company. And we have also LULAC. And LULAC I'll be talking about in a few minutes later how important it was as our organization. If we came together at the baseball teams right now, Mr. I mean, David talks about Los Novios and trying to get yes, together. Yes. Well, the it's baseball the teams was a place thing. where you could come and meet some of the, uh, perhaps a future novio, a future novia. But it's a day where, of course, it's done with the community because, of course, perhaps way back in the 30s and 40s, you didn't get to go out unless you had a chaperone that you, that went along with you. So this way, it's an acceptable way. So I have a señorita over here echándole ojitos a un señor. We have also Richfield area, Atwood area. We had a lot of oil fields in that area that we forget to mention. And so we have the Atlantic Richville team playing against El Modena in 1915. And of course, we have also in, um, in Campo Colorado, we have a group called the Juveniles Club. And I think it's important to mention that one of the reasons why we have the Mexican-American teams and the, the Latino teams, but they're really Mexicano teams, 
is because, of course, of the discrimination that many of the other Anglo-American teams would not allow the Mexicanos to be part of their teams, or sometimes didn't allow them to play in their own um, in their own parks. We have, for example, right here a picture of Mr. Tham Munoz, who was a uh, picking foreman at the Placentia Mutual Orange Association. If you are an old-time family from Orange County, your mother was probably packing oranges, or your grandmother, your father was probably picking the oranges throughout Southern California, including Anaheim, including Placencia. And so it was, if you work hard all week, you want to be able to rest, you want to be able to relax. Okay, let's get the family together and let's go ahead and go play a game. You also, one key point is also that many times your barrios or colonias or your owners of the orchards would intentionally promote baseball teams because it's a good way to keep your workers happy. If you have happy workers, they'll be happy orange pickers, happy orange packers. And so you have here the Anapalma team from El Modina, one of the ranches against the hills. You get an idea que solamente that only the men and the boys were the ones who were playing. Don't forget the mujeres, we were there. And we go, but wait a minute, Mexican women, they don't let you know their daughters go out, want to bet. <laughs> We have lots of testimonies in our schools, in our schools, in our interviews, and in our book also. How many of you have ever heard of Annie Cruz? Mm, get <laughs> <laughs> Annie Cruz, right here. Annie Cruz, if I could just read real quick what it says. Annie Cruz here from Anaheim, by the way, over here, the orange olive area, it says, with the addition of Annie Cruz to the Sweetheart staff, the Bird Herman sponsored aggregation boasts one of the most formidable pitching staffs in the league. The 17-year-old Olive Girl was so good that she was being groomed to ultimately replace one and only Bertha Reagan. And the article continues to talk about her. You have lots of adjectives <coughs> talking about how great they were at baseball, how they're wanted by some of the other teams also. You have, for example, again from the Campos, Campo Colorado, Campo Pomona, La Havre, Fullerton, the 1950s, we have the Aces, we have the La Jolla Cats, and super important, what we begin to find out is that some of the coaches are, bless you, are leaders that, of that community and are leaders who will continue to participate in civil rights organizations later on. So we have Mr. Gualberto Valadez who helped to organize the La Jolla Cats. And Mr. Valadez was a key leader today. There's a school named after him in a La Jolla area, but I'll talk about him in a few minutes. We also have some of the women, for example, Carmen Luna, who is over uh, from Santana. We have Helen Varga Moraga, women from Logan Barrio, women, for example, Carmen Luna talks to us and she talks about sometimes when they hit a home run, you have all the cars around the field that are, you know, pushing the horns, honking the horns. Sometimes we hear stories also that sometimes the lights would go out in the field. So the cars would come together and throw their lights and provide the, you know, the loose that you needed to continue wow. playing. You have Carmen Luna again who talks about her parents. Her mother would let her go play as long as the tortillas were made by the time she walked out of the <laughs> And Carmen also focuses and mentions how uh, in the past there was no fear about sharing, about sending your daughter off with the coach to go off and to play. Today you can't do that, but way back then you would trust the coach to take care of your daughters. We have also Helen Varga Moraga, who ended up playing and pitching against an all-boys team as a young high schooler. Uh, went over to, I believe it was Arizona, was refused service, and her teammates refused to also eat uh, if she couldn't join them. So there are many instances of discrimination that are mentioned. This isn't a world that is open for us. It's a world for children, Mexicano boys and girls are opening the doors for future players. We have, of course, also the Orange Tomboys from Cypress Barrio. 
And what you get in the book is a little, you know, sort of splattering of some of the different colonias, some of the different barrios that we have in Orange County. And of course, we have here Mary Garcia. And I took a photo of her between our two players. And this is Helen today and Helen in the past. Carmen Luna today, Carmen with her familia and Logan. So we sort of get the present and the past that comes together because they continue to be our community leaders today. But we can't forget Westminster, we can't forget Stanton, we can't forget the other part of Orange County. Many of our workers besides Citrus would go and work in the factories. So we have some of our players from the Ford Motor Company. We have also another group called the Road Kings. The Road Kings from Colonia 17. Where is Colonia 17? Colonia 17. Vicky, where are you? Say again. I <laughs> Colonia 17. Where are you? South of 17th, I know that. <laughs> Colonia 17th, which included part of Garden Grove and yeah. included part of Santana. Yes, it used to be Ver 17th and Verano. Okay, and Verano became? Uh, it became uh, uh, Euclid. Euclid, okay. And the thing is that if we don't do the research, we're not going to know where some of these neighborhoods are. And so Colonia 17th, we have the Road Kings, and the Road Kings started off as a car, as a car club. And then they go off in the service, serve our nation, they come back, and then they continue uh, developing their own baseball games right here. We have, we served in the service, of course, in Korea, World War II. So many of our players who started off on the dirt, you know, dirt lots in our communities, they go off to the service, become part of the military baseball games. They would go off to Okinawa and play. They would go off to, to Japan and play. So in other parts of the world, we've got our Mexicanos playing there, also being part of the teams. We have, of course, Ray Ortiz, who is right here. In fact, he's the person who is featured on the cover. Mr. Ortiz is from Anaheim from the 1930s. He was part of a team called the Anaheim Merchants. And uh, his father also played baseball, and today his daughter Tells, gives us some testimony about her father's games. We have also Jesse Flores, and I'd like to share because he was one of our um, key or one of our most recognized players. And said Jesse Flores was one of the first Mexican-born ball players to make the to make it big. He developed skills on the sandlots and the habra. His organized experience started with the local barrio team and the juvenil club. Jess went to a major league tryout in 1938, and against great odds, he was signed by the Chicago Cubs as a pitcher. He's wow. pictured above in Los Angeles in the Los Angeles Angels uniform. He pitched for the Cubs in 1942. We also have Mr. Jose Felipe. Mr. Jose Felipe, who today is 91 years old, who is ready to share his stories. He's probably got a better brain than I do. And he can give you all the details of every single game that he played. <laughs> also important, not only are we playing in our neighborhoods and our colonias, we're playing cities against cities. And we also go and are invited, for example, to Tijuana, to Ensenada. So we go across the border, and I think it's important to show that we have these international relationships. And we've always had them before. And so here's Mr. Uh, Mr. Felipe. And it says the Anaheim Tigers playing Boysen Park. Where's Boysen Park? State yeah. College of Vermont. Yeah. Okay. That's the airplane park. Yeah. Yeah. The airplane, the el, el avioncito, right. for some of you who know. Okay. The Anaheim Tigers played Boysen Park. Played played Boysen Park in Anaheim as home field in the 1950s. The winning Tigers played exclusively on Sundays and consisted of Mexican American players, mainly from Placencia and Anaheim. The postmaster who fielded an Anglo team resented the Tigers and tried various tactics to rid Boysen of them. You had Mexicanos who were using the park, but Mr. Boysen wasn't very happy about having Mexicanos playing there. And so started coming up with different kinds of rules, and so they ended up having to go to La Jolla, Placencia, to other places to play. Keep in mind also that as we're playing baseball, this is where else can we go and socialize? If we go to the swimming pool, 
Uh, we can't use it except on Mondays, which is when they have dirty waters. We can't go to the scene, or we can go to the scene, but we're either placed in the very back or we're placed on the second floor. Uh, last week, I just learned about a boycott that was done probably about the 1940s in order to have access to some of the Santana uh, theaters. So baseball brings community. Baseball develops leadership skills for the children. Baseball develops skills for the women and gets them out there also developing their own individuality and as uh, a niña, the opportunity to be able to get away for a little bit. My last presentation is again on baseball, but in this case some of the leadership and the organizations that were connected to baseball in our communities. Gualberto Val, excuse me, Valadez, who is from La Jolla, who's also very important to Anaheim, because another theme that we find is that these leaders cross neighborhoods. Gualberto Valadez was a key leader and organizer for a group called MAM. Anyone familiar with MAM? Mexican American movement in the mid 1940s was one of our civil rights organizations in Orange County. We don't know a whole lot about them, but Placencia and Anaheim provided some of the key leaders for a civil rights organization. They were also helpful in desegregating the La Palma School of Anaheim. But again, no one talks about MAM, so we need to do more research on them. We talk about the tienditas, the little stores, the neighborhood stores. My father had a tiendita in Anaheim for about 10 years. And so in Santana, we have Barrios Market. Does anyone, anyone familiar with Cruz Barrios? Okay, Cruz Barrios had a tiendita not just on Fifth and Harbor, but Cruz Barrios also was one of the key members of LULAC. LULAC, of course, being League of United Latin American Citizens, civil major civil rights organization, and it was Mr. Barrio, it was LULAC, it was Mr. Mendez, it was the Ramirez family. Several families that came together, of course, to file the... Mendez. Okay, class A uh, desegregation, Mendez versus Westminster. And the thing is that we, if we don't go and do research, then we forget that we, we think of today's leaders. You are today's leaders. But if we don't go back, we don't know who the leaders were in the 20s, the 30s, and 40s. Because the civil rights of today, this fight, this struggle, we've had it, always, always had it. We have, for example, companies like Quicksit Locks of Anaheim that sponsored a team. We have La Colonia Independencia churches sponsored teams, for example, Sacred Heart Mission. In La Colonia, we have LULAC, other teams. And lastly, I'd like to point out Mr. Francisco Moreno. Anyone familiar with Mr. Francisco Moreno? Anybody familiar with the Excelsior newspaper? Miniondas. Okay, well, all those newspapers today, we had a history. They're not new newspapers. Because if we go back to the 30s and 40s, Mr. Francisco Moreno had newspapers such as Acción. And Acción, for example, sponsored a team right here called Acción Spanish Weekly. This is how Mexicanos, how Latinos, kept uh, informed of what was going on. So today's newspapers have a precedent in some of the other newspapers that we had. I brought 40 copies of some handouts. The first, of course, is we want to promote our book. No. Secondly, um, for me, Documenting our history is very important. And our elders, we're not interviewing them, we're not keeping sufficient photographs, we're not dating our pictures, our certificates. So I've got a little handout on what can you do to presume, preserve your and our history, just some general ideas. And then I've also provided a selected bibliography on baseball, Mexican Americans, and baseball. So I'll go ahead and leave this at the table. And I think that's it. Wow. Thank you so much. Wow.